Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 109, we're going to do a walkthrough of the GU50 monoblock kit amplifier schematic. Wow, that was a mouthful. And before I forget, a week from today, our largest sale of the year, the Black Friday week, will start. And I'll give you the discount code and the details at the very end of this video. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so let's do a walkthrough of the GU50 schematic. Now this is a pure class A design, so what we talk about here will apply to other class A monoblock amplifiers. They might not be exactly the same, but a lot will be very similar. So, in previous videos, I walked you through the power supply and, the, um, and that schematic, and I walked you through the um, specifications and the uh, test data. So we're just going to focus on the actual amplifier circuit here. And I'll put links below so that you can go and see those other videos if you're interested. So our power comes in from our power supply. This is the high voltage rail up here, the B plus it's called. And we have 402 volts and the entire circuit draws 118 milliamps. Now all voltages are approximate because it depends on how close your household mains are going to be to mine. So if you're wiring to the 100 and 1920 volt um, uh, uh, configuration of the power transformer. It's a universal transformer. And your, let's say your household mains are 120 and I measured at 119. Well, everything is going to shift up a little bit. Same if it goes down a bit. So don't worry about it. Tube amplifier circuits have quite a bit of flexibility. The voltage can be a little bit different, plus or minus, and everything will work perfectly fine because of course everything is relative to each other. So let's start with the heater supply or the filament supply. So the we're going to have 6.3 volts heating up the driver stage, the 6N6P, and we'll, the filament's shown down here but of course the cathode wraps around it and we're going to look at that in a minute. And over here we've got the auxiliary supply for the power tube, the GU50, and that's a nominal 12.6 volts, and again it would heat up the cathode here. Now, C1 is a, is a little electrolytic capacitor, 47 microfarad, so you can see it's positive up here, and that is just a final filtering stage to make sure that our B plus rail here is nice and clean. We've got a plate resistor R2 of 12K 5 watts, which is fairly fairly big value, but we've got a lot of voltage dropping. 239 volts is how much we want on the plate. Our operating point is 10.5 volts. How do we set the operating point of the tube? How does it work? Well, let's go through that really quickly. So our, our, our filament or, heat, or heater heats up the cathode. It's specifically designed to fire off electrons. Once it's really hot, the electron flow in the vacuum goes like this. This is negative. The plate is positive. There's a large electrical differential. You can see it right here. The electrons flow at very high speed in huge numbers from the cathode to the plate. Okay, so now you see the power. How do we control that? Well, we need an electrical valve, and that's our grid. How do we set the grid? We can set it by putting a negative voltage here right onto the grid and varying that negative voltage or we can set it at the cathode. So this is called cathode bias. Up here this would be called fixed bias. So with cathode bias we have a resistor 750R or 750 ohm R3 and it goes to ground. So if we had a lower value, let's say 100 ohms, we would have more electron flow 
And if we had a higher value, let's say 1K or 1000 ohms, we'd have a lower flow, right? That's easy to understand. That's your electrical valve right here. C3E is a bypass electrolytic capacitor. What that does is it helps stabilize the cathode bias voltage around 10.5. So how is the grid negative if we've got a positive 10.5 volts on this electrode? Remember, this is a triode, so there's three electrodes. There's a cathode, a grid, a plate. That's it. That's your trio. Well, the circuit electrically, it doesn't recognize all this scribbling around here. What it recognizes is the cathode and the grid are literally together in circuit. They're not touching each other electrically, but they essentially work together. Let me grab a schematic and I'll show you how this goes. Now this is a cutaway, very old diagram of a 6V6 beam powered pentode, or triode, sorry, tetrode. <laughs> I knew I was going to screw that up. Um, I've got triode on the brain and I've got pentode and now we're looking at a tetrode. But let's forget the fact that that um, this is in fact a power tube. It'll show us exactly what we want to know. So our heater or our filament element goes right up the middle of the tube. That's very, very common. The cathode wraps around that. Ah, that makes sense. So that's how the cathode gets heated, right? Cathode has a special coating that helps it fire off electrons. You can see the flow of electrons. What's this? Well, this is the plate. And this is actually a beam powered plate, so it's formed. So that helps intensify and focus the beam of the electrons, makes for more power, more efficiency, yeah? And where's our grid? Well, there's our wire. It's wrapped around outside of the cathode, and it's in between the cathode and the plate, and it helps control the flow. Okay, now everybody's got that. So, how does this work? The, the grid, is relative to the cathode, negative 10.5 volts, right? Because we're 10.5 volts positive here. That means that we must be less voltage over here. So we're 10.5 negative relative. Everything is relative in two voltages. And the signal is coming in now. It's coming in from our preamp. Any high quality monoblock or amplifier is going to be driven by a high quality preamp. If you want great sonics, that's just the way it has to be. So in comes our preamp voltage. It's swinging. We show it nominally positive and then negative. That's just to keep us oriented. I'll show you in a minute how that works. What's our first resistor? R1470K. That does two things. It's a bleeder resistor. So any stray electrons that accumulate on the grid that could mess up this bias operating point, get bled off. That's why it's called a bleeder, bleeds them off to ground. But at 470K, that's 470,000 ohms. It's such a high value that our low audio signal coming in from our preamp will not bleed off. Some of it will, but such a small percentage of it, because there's no current on that signal, that essentially it doesn't see this. But this is a dead end electrically. The grid just wraps around. It doesn't connect up to anything, does it? So how does, how does the preamp circuit see a load on, on this driving side, on, the, on this stage? Well, it sees it right here at R1. It sees the load as 470K. And so long as the load is at least 10 times higher than the input impedance, Remember, impedance is just electrical resistance, yeah? So as long as it's a lot higher, and 470,000 ohms is going to be a lot higher, 10 to 100 times higher, depending on what your impedance over here is, that gives us the flexibility to have various impedances on the output stage without worrying about signal loss, right? So you want a, a low impedance signal into a high impedance signal, gives you your entire signal intact, without any losses. So that signal lands on the grid. We've got all these electrons flowing. 
and the signal modulates the flow of electrons and all of a sudden the, the, the what looked like very much like a DC um, uh, electrical signal is now it's now an AC signal riding on top of a high voltage signal. Woohoo! <laughs> and that is the secret of how audio electronics can work. Remember, audio is AC and we power our circuits with DC or direct current. So we've got high voltage DC here. We've got an AC signal that's much larger riding on top of it and because we took it off of our voltage gain stage off the plate, we end up inverting. See how the signal is now nominally negative and it's much larger. Now what are we going to do? We want to send the signal forward into the grid of the next stage. You know the 6N6P is, a, is two tubes in one envelope. So we're going to have a coupling capacitor here, C4 1.1 microfarad, 400 volts. And the beauty of a coupling capacitor is it will not pass DC. It'll pass the AC though. AC can, can come across a coupling capacitor and on to the second stage of the 6N6P. We draw these two tubes separately like this, but in fact they're one tube together, right? In fact, Let's take a look at the 6N6P. There you can see the two distinct uh, sections of the tube inside the envelope and in between you can see a line, a metal line. That is a plate in between or a shield. And that is right here on pin 9 that will go to ground. And what that shield does is it helps prevent electrical inf interference between stages. Okay. So our gain stage, our first stage, has now given us our voltage that we need enough voltage to drive the GU50 to maximum power. And that's all a driver tube does. But because this is a twin triode, I've got another section available to me. Now, if I needed more power, I could have another gain stage and take the signal off of the plate and increase the voltage even more. But I don't need that. What I do need, though, is maximum efficiency driving, and that means I need a CF stage, or a cathode follower stage. And to do that, we take the signal off the cathode. So here we have high voltage, high impedance, high gain. Here we have unity gain, so whatever went in basically comes out. But we have low impedance. Ah, okay, so how does all of this work? Well, you may have noticed that there's no plate resistor, but actually there is. So let's follow the circuit. Here's our bleeder, one meg, just like over here, just a different value. Here we're putting the signal onto the grid. Here is our cathode bias resistor, just like on our gain stage, same value even. And look where our plate resistor ended up, way down here. The circuit inverts basically. So we end up with a high voltage, low impedance um, unity signal. Same, so the same signal is down here. We need another coupling capacitor, C5. So now we block the DC. Our AC comes across. We have another bleeder, 20K in this case. That's what worked best in this circuit. Now we've got the power stage. And we have a beam powered pentode. What's the most common uh, audio pentode you're familiar with? The EL34. Developed by Philip Smullard in the late 1940s. It, it is an awesome sounding power tube. The GU50 is not a pentode, or sorry, it's, it's a beam powered pentode, and it wasn't an audio tube. It was, well, in a way it was, it was designed for mobile radios uh, for the German army in the Second World War. It was designed, I believe, by Siemens, and the Soviets copied it. Let's have a quick look at it. Now this is one ugly looking tube, and it was designed so that it could be hot changed in radios, 
Uh, remember, this is designed for combat conditions, mobile combat conditions, and it, tubes are vulnerable. So it was designed so that you can actually pull it out hot and slap in a replacement. And it's a really quite a unique looking tube. It's got an all glass base. It fit in a special holder. Some of you even had lids called garbage can lids. And if we look at it, you'll see the beam formed plates. You see how they're shaped? And I think you can maybe just see the grid wire wrapped around. This is an amazing sounding tube. People have referred to this as a poor man's 300B. It sounds that great. So I ignore how ugly it looks. It, it's also a high performing tube. We, in testing and various circuits um, on our power tube match or tester, um, we tried to kill these tubes. We did all kinds of nasty things to them and they are robustly built tubes. They're meant for difficult conditions. They're mil spec tubes. So they can take a beating and keep on ticking. In fact, I haven't lost one in uh, a stable test circuit yet. Touch wood. <laughs> Touch nice wood. Okay. So, how does the rest of this circuit work? Well, we already know how the cathode of our power tube is biased. Here it is here. We're setting 50 volts, right? That means our grid is Normally, it is a negative 50 volts relative to the cathode. We've got um, we've got a pentode or a penta, so five electrodes. Let's count them: cathode, grid, grid, grid. That's four, and plate is five. So this is the input grid, G1. It's where our signal is going to land. Grid two is the screen grid, and grid three is the suppressor grid. Now. Normally, a beam-powered pentode is going to be wired up with the suppressor grid down, probably internally in the tube. Normally, it would be wired to the cathode, effectively to ground, right? But this, this uh, circuit is wired in what's called a quasi-triode circuit. Now, why do we want to do that? We want to run this thing as close to a triode as we can, or get the, as much of the sonics of a triode as we can. To do that, what I found worked best was to put grid 2 and 3 at the same electrical potential as the plate, which is 375 volts. We have a little kind of a, a bumper resistor in here. It's just designed to help take any shocks out of the system. It could be a much larger value, but then you lose power. And this worked fine at 100 ohms. We lose a volt and we grid tie two and three together to the plate voltage. This is a, it's not, it's been done before, but it's not that common a method and it worked extremely well. Now remember, I did all kinds of configurations of how to wire this tube up and it took a lot of time because after we wire up the prototypes, I have to sit down and listen to it. And sonically, by far, this was the best configuration we came up with. What's this pin 7 here? That's a shield and it goes straight to ground. Okay, so how does the power tube work? How does the power come out? Well, power tubes are current pushers. So our bigger signal lands on the grid. It's, we've got our electrons flowing. It modulates the signal, yeah. Okay, we, the signal modulates the current flow. Everybody got that. Where's the plate resistor? There's no plate resistor. Well, maybe there is. Take a look at the high voltage B plus rail. It goes through the primary side of the output transformer and it acts very much like a plate resistor. Okay, now what about this transformer? Transformers don't connect, a, there's no wire coming across from the primary to the secondary side, right? Okay, well, let's look at how this works. We have high voltage on the primary side, we have high current, and we have high impedance. The transformer, we're gonna energize, as the current flows, we energize the, the core, we magnetize it. That transfers, that energy will come across to the other side of the transformer 
depending on how our windings are made, uh, will determine what our impedance is on the output. In this case, we want low impedance to drive speakers. So we have an 8 ohm tap, a 4 ohm tap, and of course, a zero, the zero returns to ground, right? So we have low voltage, low impedance, high current, which makes this safe to drive speakers. So what happens with our transducer here, otherwise known as a speaker? Well, when our, when our tube is pushing and it's in the positive phase, our voice coil motor assembly down, electromagnetic motor assembly back here behind the, the um, diaphragm, it pushes the diaphragm out and sends the sound wave out to us. When it goes negative, it pulls it back and it sends the wave back in this direction and so on it keeps on going positive negative positive negative right and that that is fundamentally how a basic amplifier circuit works what are what are some things you're not seeing well you're not seeing any feedback what is feedback we would take a tap at some point later in the circuit and we would tap it back maybe back to here maybe we would tap it back to here maybe we would tap it back to here now Feedback has benefits and disadvantages. One of the benefits is that it can help clean up the sound and lower distortion. It can increase power. But the big disadvantage, in my opinion, is it messes with the cohesity or the clarity uh, or the phase of the signal. And in my opinion, uh, it's to be avoided at all cost. It's, it's a cheap fix. It's a cheap way to get power, and um, one of my design goals for all of my equipment is to maintain the integrity of the signal, the original signal. I can't do much about how well the recording was looked after from the studio to the mastering to the pressing, but I can take care of it once I get my hands on it. And that is the basis of how a high quality class A, a pure class A amplifier will work. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, let's take a look at what came in this week. Now, our inventory is really up with vintage tubes. So it's basically all in because we have this huge sale coming and we will We'll sell all kinds of premium tubes, uh, but hundreds and hundreds of parts are coming in because the GU50 is getting ready to ship to test builders. Now, we're still a little ways away from that point, so when we get closer, I'll send out emails to the test builders. The, we're full for test builders. I think we even have one extra test builder on the list, but not all of them will probably choose to take their amplifiers. So if you're interested in being a test builder for the GU50, send me a note with your, you know, your interest in being a test builder. And if you, and if you qualify, you probably will. I'll put you on the list and we'll see if we can fit you in as a test builder. Because after the test builders, the amp will get released to the public, but not before then. So what parts are coming in? Well, this is that little filament transformer. Um, here it is on the schematic, and that supplies 12 volts to the GU50. The GU50 is a pretty unique power tube. Most home audio power tubes um, will run at 6.3 volts. The GU50 is a 12 volt tube, so most power supplies, um, power transformers, won't have a 12 volt tap. So, the easy, there's a lot of ways of getting 12 volts, but the easy way is to use a little auxiliary transformer, and here it is. It's a little tiny Hammond, it only puts out an amp at 12.6 volts, but it's perfect for the job, and it's not so big that it can easily fit, uh, but they all needed to be modified. This is how the, the mounting foot comes from the factory, and because it shares a bolt with the transformer on the other side of the chassis, and the bolt holes didn't line up perfectly, I had to open it up. So everyone gets modified. That's not a job I leave for kit builders. The kit builders put the entire amp together, but any special mods I do in my shop, I'm equipped for it. 
So it's, it's easier for me to do that for you guys. Take a look at this. This is about as big an open frame um, choke as you can get. These are used in the power supply to filter the raw DC and smooth it out. And they, these are massive. This is about as big as you can get open frame. After this, you end up in an enclosed transformer style with bells. And those get mounted on the top. The advantage of an open frame is that if you can fit it, you can put it inside the amplifier and not have all that clutter on top. So that's my preference. Any bigger of an amplifier, though, we'd have to go with a housed choke. And a whole bunch of these just came in. In fact, the only thing holding us up is the power transformers. They're huge, they're expensive, and the current shipping date is December the 15th. They're supposed to come in. So we're actually going to organize the uh, GU50 shipments to test builders to line up. We'll be ready actually to ship when those transformers arrive. We can get the whole kit put together and ready to go because Christmas is is a wonderful time to spend with the family and to take a break from work. And I have, personally, I have traditionally, I have built uh, a prototype amp during the holidays because I have more time. The, whatever business I'm in has always slowed down over the holidays. So it's a great time to build a kit um, or, in my case, a prototype. So that's why we're getting organized so that we can get these, um, these GU50s out to the test builders on in a reasonable time. Now, the biggest sale of the year starts in a week. Starts on Friday, November the 18th, and it runs to Sunday, November the 22nd, 7th. I'm reading upside down here. <laughs> so it runs for just a little over a week. It covers the Black Friday sale week. And the great thing about this sale is that you can get 15% off the entire purchase. So during this week, I have good customers that save up orders for premium tubes and they'll put big orders in, but don't delay. Even though the sale will run for, I think, nine days, um, the, the, the best, highest demand tubes will all go in the first few days. So the code you're going to use is Black Friday 15. Now, the only thing that's not included in the sale are the kit amps. The margins on kit amps are just so so tight, there's no way we can discount them. And gift certificates, of course. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. And Charles is back, so hopefully next Friday we'll have him uh, join us for uh, a tube lab. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>